SJC 13541, SNH Independent Premium Brands East LLC et al. v. Alcoholic Beverages Control Commission et al. Attorney Green. Good. Still morning. Good morning, Your Honors. <laughs> May it please the court. Benjamin Green, on behalf of the appellants, SNH Independent Premium Brands East and SNH Independent Premium Brands West. Section 25E of the Liquor Control Act is a fair trade regulation that prevents suppliers, those that manufacture or produce alcoholic beverages, from abusing their superior bargaining power. As suppliers are at the top of the distribution chain, 25E impacts not only wholesalers, who are in the middle, but also retailers and consumers. As explicitly stated in the statute, these protections are afforded to any licensed wholesaler, which by its plain meaning includes in-state wholesalers with Section 18 licenses and licensed out-of-state wholesalers who have Section 18B certificates. Uh, okay, so th that last part is the part that uh, is the crux of the case, as far as I can tell, right? And it doesn't, can you tell me why you just said that that's plain meaning? Because m maybe you can point me to the ex exact statutory language that you think makes that plain, uh, plain. Absolutely, Your Honor. So it, it goes to the phrase, any licensed wholesaler, which is in the first paragraph. Right, of, of, you're talking about 25E. Of here, 25E, right? yes, sure. Your Honor. So, um, and licensed wholesalers also used in Section 18. Yes. Uh, it's, it, it's used, but there's also a phrase about being a certified out-of-state supplier, correct? Yes, yeah, so Section 18B deals with those that have licenses out of state. And Section 18 does not say that out of state certified suppliers are also licensed wholesalers. No, Section 18 does not use right. that language. So when you say that the statutory language is plain, I'm looking for an explicit statutory provision that says what you just argued, which is that the phrase any licensed wholesaler includes out-of-state certified suppliers. Yes, Your Honor. So, Is there any such statutory language? Your Honor, I would say that the phrase any, which is explicitly included in the statute, means that the term licensed wholesaler should have the broadest possible meaning. Okay, that's an interpretation. I, my question was slightly different. My question was one of an explicit statutory provision. Because if your answer is yes, I'm going to ask you to point it to me. If your answer is no, we can move on and then go into the realm of interpreting language as opposed to saying it's explicitly provided. So I'd say no, Your Honor, but I would point you to the legislative history of the statute. At one point, the, the statute in 18B said that certificate holders with 18B cannot be considered licensees anywhere in this chapter. That language was removed and added only into uh, another section of 25 that deals with, with credit terms. So the legislature explicitly removed basically a statement that said kind of the opposite of that, that said you can't consider Section 18Bs to be licensees in other sections. But it didn't make them licensed wholesalers. They're only licensed wholesalers if we take the fact that they have a license from some other state, right? They're clearly not, they're in a different category. Whether the different category is constitutional or not is a separate question, but they're clearly in a different category, aren't they? Well, yes, sir. they are licensed by a different authority from a different state. And so consistent with the Commerce Clause, given that 
observation. Um, how is it possible that the ABCC can possibly regulate things that are happening out of Massachusetts consistent with the Commerce Clause? Thank you, Your Honor. So in terms of regulation, there's multiple ways to look at it. The first is that the Commission can regulate parties that have consented to the jurisdiction of the Commission, which all the regard to their out-of-state supply activities? Well, when you, the language is clear that you have to abide by all the laws of the Liquor Control Act and the Commission. So it is With regard to their activities and how they choose to supply things outside of Massachusetts. The, the statutory language does not include an exception for that. But the Commerce Clause does. It, it limits the regulatory authority of the ABCC to things that happen in the Commonwealth. Once the Commonwealth starts extending its reach to things that happen, as did here, outside of the Commonwealth, then I think that squarely might present a Commerce Clause problem. So I'd also point out, Your Honor, that the issue that you're addressing, which is important, doesn't change based on the interpretation that the Commission has put forth. And the reason because of that is that their position is that licensed wholesalers get this protection. But licensed wholesalers in Massachusetts don't have to sell to retailers in Massachusetts. They can sell to other wholesalers, and they can sell to wholesalers in any other states. So a licensed wholesaler in Massachusetts could purchase beverages from a supplier in California. The beverages could never leave there. And that licensed wholesaler could then sell those beverages to, say, Colorado and Florida. So you'd end up with the same exact jurisdictional issue with their interpretation as well. Okay. But don't the licensed wholesalers, they have a lot of responsibilities. They have to... That's how we collect taxes on the alcohol. They have, they're sort of the monitoring point, right? And, and so to be a licensed wholesaler, you take on a bunch of responsibilities that an 18B person doesn't take on, right? Sometimes, Your Honor, depending on how you operate. Isn't all times? Doesn't, isn't a licensed wholesaler held up to a bunch of tasks and responsibilities you got to be able to go to their warehouse and check the inventory. You 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 put taxes on, um, and your guys out of state wholesalers. No one's checking their inventory because you can't. They don't have anything. They don't have a place of business in Massachusetts, and and they pay less to become one. Aren't you? You're comparing apples to oranges. There may still be discriminatory treatment. I'm not. I'm not getting away from that. But it looks like the statutory argument seems to have very little merit to it. Your yeah, Honor, first I'd say that Section 25E doesn't regulate wholesalers. It actually regulates suppliers. It prevents suppliers from engaging in unfair business practices. Yeah, but the whole licensed wholesalers, there's all kinds of things they have to do that, you know, and that's how we make money in Massachusetts. That's how we collect our taxes, right? Mm -hmm. Um, off of what's done in their premises. Your Honor, I'm not arguing that there aren't distinctions between uh, well, in-state just... wholesalers and out-of-state wholesalers, and that the regulations in-state are different than the regulations out-of-state. Right, but so then doesn't that just leave you with your dormant commerce clause problem argument? I just don't see your statutory argument. I do see, I do want to understand your commerce clause argument, because clearly we're giving special rights and special obligations to a Massachusetts company that we're not giving to others, but they're performing a different function under the statute. They can perform different functions. A wholesaler in Massachusetts who's licensed, though, could be performing the exact same function of selling just to other wholesalers. Doesn't the wholesaler would. still have to do all that tax collection and other stuff? A licensed wholesaler in Massachusetts even if they're selling only to other licensed wholesalers, aren't they subject to a bunch of obligations as well? I think it depends on the fact situation. I think the other wholesaler they send, sell to then might become the obligate of certain obligations. Um, but I think you are correct that we should jump into the dormant commerce clause issue as that is really central to our overall argument. Right. Now, Although you guys, although your honor has noted You're the You're not challenging the constitutionality of section 18, correct? Sorry, your honor? You're not challenging the constitutionality of section 18. I am not, your honor. So 
No. Uh, this is solely a challenge to Section 25 in terms of a constitutional challenge. Solely 25E, yes, Your Honor. 25E. How do you get there without from the face of 25E? I don't see on the face of 25E any disparate treatment depending on whether a person is out of state or a company is an out of state company or an in state company. There are no, none of these distinctions are drawn in 20, Section 25E. Yes, Your Honor. So if Section 25E, if the term any licensed wholesaler can refer only to Section 18 wholesalers, and Section 18 wholesalers have to be either individuals that are citizens or LLCs that are owned by citizens or companies that are incorporated in Massachusetts, then Section 25E, the protections, So are you're limited. not, but you had just told Justice Wolohogen that you're not challenging Section 18. At least, and, and as I understand it, there's been a representation that post the Supreme Court case, it's no longer being um, enforced in that out-of-state versus in-state way. That's correct. I'm not challenging 18. So, At the time, though, that the, just to clarify, the ABC's, the commission's position about non-enforcement did not arise until after the commission dismissed our 25E Let petition. me put my question a different way. Just pretend Section 18 doesn't exist for the yes. moment. Just pretend. And let's look. I, I'm looking right now at Section 25E without reference to anything beyond Section 25E. Is there anything within 25E itself that could give rise, language of 25E, to a dormant commerce clause argument? So, Your Honor, if you, if you were to just look at 25E in pure isolation, then I don't think you would interpret the phrase any licensed wholesaler to refer to a Section 18 licensee. It would, it would interpret So on its everywhere. face, it would not raise a, a dormant commerce clause issue if we limit it just to 25E. If you limit it to 25E, unless it's the interpretation that is presented by the commission is that that only applies to in-state wholesalers. Okay, so, um, so that seems to, I hate to repeat myself, but if you're not challenging section, the constitutionality of section 18 on dormant commerce clause grounds or on the basis of Tennessee distillery or whatever the name is of that uh, Supreme Court case, how do you shoehorn those arguments into a challenge of, on, of Section 25E alone? You know, because when our appellant went to get 25E protections, the commission said these protections are not afforded to out-of-state wholesalers. And that basically set the chain of, okay, by the commission's standard and their interpretation, 25E is only protects in-state wholesalers, and does not protect out-of-state wholesalers. Does it matter that your client never sought to be a licensed wholesaler? No, Your Honor, because at the time, they would not have technically been able to. What are you saying is the time? At the time that they filed the petition, they could not have gotten a Section 18 wholesaler certificate because they are a, not a domestic Massachusetts company. So was the petition filed after Tennessee or before? It was filed after Tennessee, but before the commission said that they are no longer enforcing the residency Said or didn't, when did the ABCC stop? When did it react to Tennessee? Your Honor, that's slightly unclear from the record. Okay. During the briefing at the, the motion for judgment on the pleading stage, an affidavit was submitted by the commission saying that after they had evaluated post-Tennessee, and I don't know if they gave a specific date, since then, at some point, they stopped enforcing so this. So if they stopped that enforcement before you filed your petition? I would say, Your Honor, if they had stopped the enforcement before the issue itself arose, before we were cut off from our supplier, and at that point had a chance to get become a Section 18 licensee and get those protections, that would have made a difference. But by the time kind of Why would that make a difference? Because I thought there was a representation in your brief that there's no time limit as on when you can file the 25E petition. I, I don't believe that's actually raised in the, in the Is brief. there a time limit? Um, 
I'm not sure of the time limit, but there's no argument in this case that this was not timely filed. No, no, but if there's no time limit. Oh, well, Your Honor, yeah, I, theoretically, although it's never been raised, if your question is, at this point, could S&H now get a Section 18 license? And or, then, you know, and, one month later, then And then did. bring a 25E challenge? Or get a license and, and have brought the challenge afterwards, because Tennessee was decided before you filed your petition. You don't actually then go and seek to become a licensed wholesaler. Instead, you just file a petition. As far as we know, it may be that ABCC had already changed its position with respect to in-state and out-of-state out entities being entitled to become licensed wholesalers. Why doesn't all that matter? So, Your Honor, I don't believe it would be fair to hold my client to the standard of knowing what the ABCC is doing internally, having never said but, it publicly. But maybe to the standard of seeking to find out by filing an application to become a licensed wholesaler. It is possible that that might have been a way, but that's a, a very roundabout way to do it. And also the issue here, there is, there's no timeline necessarily when you have to file the 25B petition that's raised. But practically, once you're cut off from a supplier, you're going to go out of business unless you get immediate relief. And that's why you go immediately to the, to the commission and say, can you please give us this relief that basically the supplies will can keep coming to us so that we can stay in business? How long was it after you were cut off that you filed the petition? I thought it was there was some separation in time. I don't believe it was more than a month or so. Further questions? Oh. Can I further address the Commerce Clause? Just, I just want to address the similarly situated issue, just so it's clear. I'll give you a minute. Thank you, Your Honor. So the similarly situated, the way that test works in the context of a dormant commerce clause, it's an economic market test. It's not an in-state regulation versus out-of-state regulation test. The key questions are the in-state entities and the out-of-state entities selling the same product to the same market. And that's exactly what's going on here. In-state wholesalers sell alcoholic beverages to other state wholesalers. And my client, the out-of-state licensed wholesaler, also sells alcoholic beverages to in-state wholesalers. But not to retailers. Not to retailers. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Attorney Fignery. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Assistant Attorney General Christine Feminari on behalf of the EPALI, the Alcoholic Beverages Control Commission. The court should affirm the commission's decision below, which held that petitions under general law, chapter 138, section 25E, can only be invoked by Massachusetts wholesalers who are licensed under section 18. Because the commission's interpretation was based on the unambiguous statutory text, um, the court does not need to reach the canon of constitutional avoidance that the appellants propose. But even if the court were to find that the statute was ambiguous, the court should defer to the commission's reasonable interpretation because it's consistent with the statutory scheme, the statutory purpose. It does not violate the Dormant Commerce Clause, and it avoids the absurd result of having a Massachusetts state agency regulate sales that occur entirely out that. of the state. I get that part. I'm just trying to understand. The U.S. Supreme Court test on the Dormant Commerce Clause, as far as I can figure it out, is that it's, you can't discriminate, you can't discriminate against out-of-state entities um, who, are doing, who are basically performing the same function. Um, here, the only people who can become licensed wholesalers, right, are Massachusetts corporations. Is that ones with a domicile here, right? Is that right? Well, Your Honor, the residency requirement is no longer being enforced in light of Tennessee wines. Okay, so now back to Justice Will Hogan's question. So if they had applied, if SNH had applied to be a licensed wholesaler, they would have been given that? Only if they met the other requirements of Section 18. And you'll see that Section... Meaning that they set up a business here that you could 
make them tax, you know, subject to your taxation procedures and everything else? Is that what you're saying? Yes, Your Honor, because Section 18 um, has other requirements such as having a warehouse in the Commonwealth, only pur making purchases from the primary American uh, source, um, only paying certain excise taxes. And um, if you look to the language in- So, so is Justice Wolhogen's question then dispositive of the whole case that because they didn't, because you would have given them this if they sought it and they didn't seek it, the rest of this is kind of just academic? That could be one way to resolve the case, Your Honor, yes. Um, we, would, we would agree that they didn't uh, you know, seek something that would be. Uh, and because. Is that it? Sorry. Is that, ahead, a, is, no. that, is, is that a quasi standing issue or is that a, some other kind of or mootness or prematurity or what, 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 what maybe rubric does that fall under? Well, Your Honor, it's difficult here because um, the, the case arose out of um, the 25E petition to the, to the commission. And so the commission didn't develop a factual record as to the parties, you know, um, applications or things like that. So the case has proceeded um, through a comparison of the statutory definitions of licensed wholesalers. Um, and so we've been speaking about it in the abstract. Um, so, but it's, it, is, it, is my understanding correct that at the time they filed the 25E petition, ABCC had already changed its interpretation, let's say, of Section 18B, I guess, uh, in light of the Tennessee case. Yes, Your Honor, but to be fair to the other side, there hadn't been a public uh, pronouncement of that, and so the public pronouncement didn't come until the affidavit was filed in this Can case. Can I ask a further question along the same lines? Where, was the opposite inference also out there, that they couldn't get such a license because you had made it clear that that was not available to them? I'm just trying to figure out whether the reason they didn't make this argument or attempt to get themselves out of this bind was because they were being told they couldn't become a Massachusetts wholesaler. Uh, Your Honor, I have no knowledge of what they were or weren't told. I'm just asking about what the record shows. The record yeah. doesn't show anything about that, Your but Honor. But at the time they filed their 25E petition, the agency was saying uh, we are adhering to the, the residency requirements written into Section 18. That there has been no change in that policy. There the only been, change had come from the Supreme Court that said that is unconstitutional. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. That's correct. Um, when you say residency requirements, um, meaning having a warehouse here or meaning that you were a Massachusetts, you know, somehow satisfying that you're a Massachusetts corporation. I'm just trying to understand what the latter, Your Honor, um, because um, in the Tennessee wine case and in the Grand Home case, there's a distinction drawn between residency requirements in these three-tier systems mm -hmm. and in-state presence requirements. And so there's a difference between having, you know, a warehouse in Massachusetts where you store products in the state that's subject to inspections and being a resident of Massachusetts. And the Tennessee wine case, um, the Supreme Court said that the residency requirement was not a fundamental aspect of the three-tier distribution scheme, but it didn't um, address in-state physical premise requirements, and it in fact noted that um, the retailers at issue in that case had in-state physical premises, which would help for regulation, and that's part of why they rejected the residency um, requirement. But Your Honors, I, I'd like to... But, but I, again, because I just, I, I just want to make sure I fully get this. So at the time they're seeking, at the time they're bringing this 25E, you have not been allowing someone to be a licensed wholesaler unless what? They had a warehouse and they were what? A resident of the Commonwealth. Okay. Yeah. And that was unconstitutional once the Supreme Court issued that decision. Because they're saying it's okay to distinguish them based on having a warehouse. Requiring them to have a warehouse was required, but not making them a resident. Yes, Your Honor. But And when we look at this record, we're not going to be able to discern whether these guys have been properly informed of this because um, it's going to be an ambiguous record. 
Yes, Your Honor, there's nothing in the record about whether they've been informed of this. But I, I would say that it's not relevant to the question before the court of whether uh, the commission has jurisdiction under 25E over uh, entities that are not licensed wholesalers in Massachusetts. That goes to the residency requirement of Section 18 and whether that's constitutional, and the appellants are not challenging that here. They're challenging Section 25E, and they attempt to inject ambiguity into the language any licensed wholesaler in Section 25E by saying that must mean anyone anywhere in the country who um, is a wholesale, has a wholesaler license. But we know that can't be the case based on common sense and the overall statutory scheme. Uh, the commission- The phrase licensed wholesaler is not defined anywhere as a phrase licensed wholesaler. Am I correct? There's no definition, Your Honor, but Section 18 um, is titled Wholesalers and Importers Licenses, and it provides that licenses as wholesalers and importers may be provided. Sure, so what I'm wondering is, uh, I mean, licensed wholesalers, since it's not explicitly de a defined term, I understand at least linguistically to mean a wholesaler who is licensed. Yes, Your Honor, I'd agree okay. with that. So that would have two parts. One is, is this, this particular entity a wholesaler, and is this particular entity licensed? We know it was not licensed. So then the question is, was it a wholesaler? What's your position on that question? Your Honor, the, the, uh, uh, if you look to the language of Section 18B, um, it says no, in the second paragraph, no person who sell, holds a certificate under this section shall hold or be granted a license under Section 18. Mm -hmm. So no person who is a certificate of compliance holder can hold a wholesaler license in Massachusetts. It can't be both. It cannot be both, Your Honor. And they were not operating as both because they were not making a sale to a retailer. And the appellants argued that... Um, it would be both. So your answer is both a legal answer and a factual answer. The legal answer being because of 18B, they can't be both a certificate holder and a and a and a wholesaler license. Yeah. And the and the factual question, the factual answer is, and they were never selling to retailers, so they're not a wholesaler. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And um, it's also worth mentioning that. The statutory scheme of what the commission can regulate is entities doing business in the Massachusetts market. That's the operative transaction that 25E protects. And um, Section 18 only allows wholesalers to make purchases from other licensees. It says, you know, um, those who are any manufacturer licensed under the provisions of Section 19 or holders of certificate of compliance under Section 18B. So when the wholesaler it, under Section 18 is making a purchase, that's a transaction that comes into Massachusetts. And we know that because Section 18 also says that in order to ensure the necessary control of traffic and alcoholic beverages, et cetera, et cetera, the shipment of such beverages into this commonwealth, except as provided in this section and two other sections, is hereby prohibited. So the alcoholic product only enters Massachusetts once it is purchased by a licensed wholesaler. And your honors, um, the transaction that the appellants are trying to uh, invoke the protections of 25E here did not occur within the Massachusetts market. It's a Section 18B certificate of compliance holder who, who is located in Colorado and California making a purchase and having sales relationships with an Austrian brewery. That has nothing to do with Massachusetts. It's not until the Section 18B Certificate of Compliance holder makes a sale to the Section 18 licensed wholesaler that it comes within the Massachusetts market and then within the regulatory authority of the commission. Why can't, why can't a licensed wholesaler under 25E include um, 18B certificate holders because to be a certificate holder, you have to be licensed to sell in Massachusetts. I'm sorry, Your Honor, I'm not sure I understand your question. So it's convoluted, mm -hmm. but, um, and I ha don't have a voice today, but licensed wholesaler, right, um, as a term, could arguably include an 18B certificate holder because an 18B certificate holder is somebody who has a license 
I, I understand that that could be uh, an interpretation, Your Honor, but it wouldn't be a reasonable interpretation here because it would require the commission to regulate um, activity outside of the state, and that would, um, first off, create the risk of inconsistent. So when, when, when we read licensed wholesaler, it has to be a wholesaler licensed in Massachusetts. Yes, Your Honor, and if you look at the language of Section 18B, where the legislature intended to refer to licensees that had licenses granted in other states, they indicated that. Um, the first section of, the first sentence of Section 18B says you can issue a certificate of compliance to a licensee having a place of business located and a license granted outside the Commonwealth. Um, Your Honor, I see I've exceeded my time, but if I could just briefly um, address one more point. Right, you've got the same minute he did. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I just want to direct Your Honor's attention to the Anheuser-Busch case, which is uh, 75 Mass App Court 203 that's cited in the brief. And in that uh, case, uh, there's a discussion of the interpretation of the phrase um, a license under Section 18. And in interpreting that section, um, the appeals court uh, referenced specifically that Section 18 wholesaler licenses, there's different types if you look in Section 18. There's one for all alcoholic beverages, and there's some for just malt beverages and wine. And the, the appeals court in that case said if uh, the legislature had intended to include both types of licensed wholesalers under Section 18, they would have used the word any license under Section 18. So it's completely plausible and reasonable that the phrase any licensed wholesaler here is simply referring to the two types of wholesalers under Section 18, and that would avoid um, the impermissible construction uh, proffered by the appellants. And for those reasons, we'd ask the court to affirm. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. Dennis McKenna representing the other uh, appellees, uh, Winnetou, Global Beer, and Stiegel. Um, in my time, I wanted to address the two questions Justice Woolleyhan had, and that was um, the timing of the termination versus the timing of the filing. The notice of termination was January 2019. The filing of the 25 petition was December 2019. And the second question was, I believe, uh, referring to why can't the language uh, of 25E meaning, mean, actually it might have been Justice Wenlatt, um, be a certificate of compliance holder who is a wholesaler in some other state, and that is because um, it, you have to be a wholesaler in Massachusetts for the three levels. So in this case, um, s &H was at the supplier level. They purchased from my client, Stiegel, an Austrian brewer. They purchased it to go somewhere else, not into Massachusetts. Stiegel would ship um, uh, not into Massachusetts, depending on whether it was east um, or west. But neither East nor West ever sold to a retailer. And in Massachusetts, the three tiers are supplier, wholesaler, and then retail. With I guess my question was a little more basic <laughs> um, and maybe unreasonable, as your uh, counsel on your side said. Um, but the, the 18B talks about people who are licensed, right? And, and then uh, 25E also talks about people who are licensed. And my question was really, why can't that license in 18B refer to the same license as 25E? Because... And you're um, saying it's because of this three-tier system. Is that your answer? Right. It's any licensed wholesaler, meaning wholesaler in Massachusetts, because a wholesaler in Massachusetts is selling to the retail level, um, sections 12 and 15, so section 18 at level right, two. Right, but it doesn't have to be that way. Maybe it's the most reasonable interpretation, but it could be any licensed wholesaler is somebody like SNH East or West who uh, 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 has a license and is a wholesaler. They're not really the supplier. Your client is the supplier, right? No, my client's the manufacturer who would be an 
18B certificate of compliance holder so they can sell to another certificate of compliance holder being their importer, which is S&H, not a wholesaler. So my client can't sell to a wholesaler. Okay, my client. My client sells to an importer, which is the certificate of compliance holder being S&H. And the other reason I came to uh, to, uh, we joined the brief of the ABCC. We have nothing to add or to the amicus. Um, the real world implication is that which is particularly emphasized by the amicus, which is expanding the ABC's uh, interpretation in the jurisdiction. It becomes extraterritorial. And what's happening in the Superior Court between not including the uh, ABCC but including my clients is exactly what's the threat, which is the claim in the Superior Court against Stiegel by the s &H East and West is based upon 25E, you could not terminate us, even though from my Austrian brewer's perspective, they saw s &H as an at-will relationship. There was no written contract, terminable at will, um, and that's what happened after several years. According to the theory that's bootstrapped in the Superior Court case, but which is being argued in this court, that breach by the Austrian brewer gives rise to a breach of contract claim and treble damages, uh, uh, exposing Stiegel to uh, millions of dollars of alleged damages. That's the real world implication. If there are no further questions, I rest. Thank you.